thank you for having me and thank you for making time this afternoon to uh, come to my talk. So, you know, I, I, I'll tell you the following. When I was an undergrad, I was applying for uh, grad school. I applied to uh, Iowa State and I was accepted, but I didn't come. So 30 years later, here I am, right? So thank you very much for, uh, for having me and uh, really enjoyed my meeting with you uh, once I opened this uh, school. So I'm going to be talking about um, compressive hardware something, right? hardware, uh, hardware compressive something. And I'm going to start with speaking about uh, how do you apply this technique to video compression, but also I'm hoping to uh, go out some time to talk about some of the neural recording stuff that we're doing and to see how the generalized idea can be applied to it. So this work is primarily the work of my PhD work. So one problem with this, that's why I keep going to end this. Uh, this is probably the work of um, my student, Jack Jang, who's now doing a postdoc with uh, Matt uh, Stewart, of, uh, Matt Woods, excuse me, up at MIT. So he's been the one who's right, who's doing this work, uh, this work uh, with some of the uh, signal processing um, faculty. So I thought I'd spend a couple of minutes to tell you a little bit about topics for those of you who don't know, but especially uh, undergrads who are thinking about grad school as well as um, PhDs who are thinking about faculty positions. So this is just a snapshot of who we are. See the campus is beautiful. Um, we spend, uh, we are usually the leader in, um, in research expenditures per year. We, the last time it was counted it was 2.4 billion dollars um, in 2016. We cover everything from uh, this in ECE, we go everything from uh, biological imaging all the way through the microsystems to optics. Uh, there are multiple schools. Uh, I am in the um, uh, Wider School of Engineering. The Applied Physics Laboratories um, is one of the places where you may have remembered the flyby of Pluto that happened in Pluto a couple of years back. That came out of, um, of the Applied Physics Lab. It's uh, essentially the scalp works from the uh, the medical school, which some of many of you are going to be familiar with, that's kind of the gorilla in the room, really big, um, where we have a lot of interactions with um, in some other um, schools. So uh, uh, one thing about hope is that there's very little barriers between the different schools and divisions and departments. There's a lot of interactions between our various uh, divisions. So this is more about the, uh, the engineering school. Yeah, about uh, 600 graduates, uh, graduate students, and 800 undergraduates. So it's very small compared to the program for what you have here. Um, for the uh, Department of Natural Engineering itself, uh, we have 21 faculty members, 10 faculty members. Uh, but the total program faculty is about 51. Those are essentially uh, folks from different divisions and different departments who actually participate in our education system. So you end up having a big um, and uh, yeah, we have about 150 students and about 150 undergrads. I know this is like one of the courses, but that's, <laughs> you know, that's what we have. <coughs> uh, these are the areas in which we concentrate everything from um, cyber biological systems all the way through the machine interface. And um, these are the faces that you would find if you come to business. Uh, but primarily, what I'll get at is that there's a very collaborative environment where opportunities. So that's my job as the department chair. I'm required to do that, so that's scary. But it's, you know, it's kind of really about the real. So let me get into the talk itself now, right? So as you know, everybody knows about Moore's Law, right? I promise everything getting smaller, everything getting faster. But it doesn't work for everything, right? For batteries, definitely not, right? You know that. Um, I love circuits as well. There's, there's some issues, right? We cannot just keep making them smaller and uh, making them faster. And uh, power consumption becomes a big deal. So what we want to try to do then as part of um, our work is try to come up with ways that we can address the issues of the fact that we have limited power. Um, if, on top of that, if we try to communicate this, you know, try to communicate information that is gleaned through like multiple different sensors distributed in different places, uh, we have to think about what is the way to minimize communications. So the question is, um, where does power really go when you start thinking about these developing sensor networks or sensor systems? And uh, let me start over here. This is from a 
typical pathway of a neural recording system, right? There's the analog front end, which is responsible for actually detecting the neural signals. Then you've got to go to some kind of digitization, <coughs> followed by maybe some uh, digital processing that allows you, for example, to clean out noise or things like that to those files. And then at the end, you want to communicate this out, right? So this uh, usually is an embedded system. It's put in front of the brain, in front of the body in some way. And if you look at the power um, kind of uh, distribution, you see that the majority, the vast majority of power goes into the wireless link, right? Um, and of course, um, in the front end, we can't really do too much about this, unfortunately. That's the analog part. But maybe we can do something about reducing what goes on here. Okay? So that's one thing that we're going to try to catch. Similarly, now if you move to image sensor, um, so this is your camera, your, you know, your cell phone, or uh, whatever you have on your, on your um, drone or something like that. You see kind of the similar kind of thing. If you have a normal image sensor, uh, the majority of the data goes into the ADC, right? And this doesn't even include the communications part, right? It goes only a function of what it is that you are, um, that you're capture. Uh, and then the I.O. part is really getting the data off and then ultimately the pixels themselves. Unless you do something like a little bit smarter compression, you are, you know, you are basically stuck in this kind of way. So my work has been how to try to, you know, to, to reduce the amount of data that you need to communicate in order to try to address as much as I can. But nothing else for free, right? There is a penalty in trying to address one of the other, and I hope I will express this. So the technique that I've uh, been uh, drawn to over the last few years has to do with this notion of compressive sampling, right? And that is the idea that, you know, when Nyquist said that um, you need to sample uh, data at least twice the frequency of the highest, um, uh, highest frequency component of your signal, that implied that the signal was not sparse, meaning that the signal essentially was, you know, if I look at this as the, the, um, uh, the spectrum, the signal was pretty flat. Or at least contain all the frequencies of the spectrum, right? So if I'm going to try to sample this, then I need to essentially do, I, I need to make sure that my sampling um, does not have uh, aliasing, so I need to be at least twice the frequency away from the avoidance, right? But on the other hand, if I have a scenario where I know that my signal is sparse in some, in some domain, right? then I may not need to actually satisfy the, the Nyquist criteria. So imagine now, instead of having this signal that covers the entire spectrum from here to here, it only has a couple of, of areas that has, and, and the other place it doesn't, right? So now when I repeat it, I can actually move my, my repeating signal to a lower frequency, and as long as I don't have the two spikes overlapping each other in some way, Right, then I can essentially reproduce the signal without any kind of uh, any kind of uh, anything. So I can, you know, this would be double. I can almost put it down to just next to it, right? And I would still be able to represent the signal. That's kind of the crust of of what um, you know, of what basically Candice and and Dana uh, were basically um, you know, argued um, back in 2006. So. That idea then has to be somehow translated to a, a mechanism by which one can implement them. And this is a classical description in <coughs> matrix form of what goes on in such a system. Right? So the idea is that you have a, um, a signal X. This is your original signal that you're trying to represent. Right? It's usually composed of some kind of a dictionary, which is your basis. Right? So Fourier wavelet, whatever the case may be. And then there's a vector, alpha, that when you uh, take the product of the dictionary with a vector, you basically get your signal that is completely uh, to, be, uh, to be seen, right? So this is now represented here as a dictionary matrix over here. And this, right now, I haven't said anything about the composition of alpha. Right? I'm just saying that this is what it is, right? So when I produce a compressed, um, uh, measurement of that signal alpha, uh, me, that, of that signal x. What I'm going to do is I'm going to have some kind of assembling matrix. And so far, even though it's says random and so on, I haven't really specified what it is yet, right? 
Um, I'm going to have some kind of a sampling matrix that when it operates on the sig uh, that when it operates on the signal X, that's what gives me my my compressed um, um, my compressed sample, right? And now this is where the um, the kind of the theorems of, of uh, sparsity and and so on comes into play, and that is that. If you know that your signal is sparse in, in a particular uh, domain of this dictionary, which means that not every element of this vector alpha has a value, right? then I can essentially use a random sampling matrix to produce my, um, uh, to produce my measurement, which I can then invert by effectively figuring out what is the most likely sparse uh, um, uh, vector alpha, which will allow me to match my signal as close as possible. Okay? So that's really the, the name of the game. So to, for me to figure out what is the sparsest alpha um, that would allow me to do that, that's where I do essentially lasso L1 norm, uh, uh, which is essentially a, satis a satisfaction of this you know, basically minimization of alpha by an, uh, by an L1 norm um, uh, metric subject to the fact that Y has to be ultimately this whole uh, matrix here, this combination operating on alpha, right? So if I can do that, then I can determine exactly what my alpha is. And if I know what my alpha is, then I can determine exactly what my X is because I, oops, excuse me, what? Because I can go here I'm going to stop doing that. <coughs> okay, at this point. Yeah, that's right. So that thing I can just go right here and actually compute my x given my alpha. Okay, so that's the idea. So now, how does that essentially move forward? And, and obviously, there's a bunch of mathematics that bound how many samples you need and what kind of matrix can, that can work for. That I will leave it as a homework problem to all the grad students. Okay. But you can, you can read up about it though, basically, right? So now there's there are two problems that, I'm, that I will show that this kind of technique can be used to really simplify the, uh, uh, the amount of data that you need to communicate. In one case, it's a limit sensor, and in another case, it's a neural recording sensor, right? And I will show you the two sides. So for the image sensing scenario, this is kind of the, you know, the, the, the trade off that one comes into play, right? So we always want high frame rates, right? We want to get cameras that can capture as many frames as we can. But on the other hand, we also want to be low power. We also want to have high, high signal to noise ratio. We want to have no motion blurring. Of course, the faster the frame rate, the better for motion blurring. And we want it to be high, high, high dynamic range. And it turns out that these things do not always go in the same direction. They go up across each other. If you want high power, well, if you want high frame rate, you got a cost, there's a cost of power. If you want high resolution, you pay a price in temporal resolution. If you want you know, uh, better um, uh, immunity to motion blurring, then you've got to pay a price with signal to noise, and, and so on and so forth. And I pose it to you that with the, uh, with the compressive sampling approaches that I'm, I'm going to present to you, you can get have your cake and eat it too. You know, just like in the case of you know, with Nyquist, you know, we could sample way your Nyquist and re reproduce the signal uniquely. In this case as well, you can get away with, you know, with, uh, with kind of trying to satisfy all these things at the same time. So let's see how that happens. So in a typical um, imaging system, what you have is you have essentially a bunch of, of videos, of video frames, that if I was to essentially say, look, I'm going to record, let's say, 100 frames, and I'm going to sum it all together and create one frame, and this is obviously very compressed, right? Because it's 100 to 1 compression. But if I was to look at this particular frame itself here, I would have trouble, right? Because you know, I would have a lot of motion blurring, right? So if something moves, and in this, in this video here, or this frame here, it might be like over this side. But by the time you get to over there, it's on that side. When you collapse it and sum it all together, all you'll see is right? Not a good thing. So I want to be able to still start from one frame, but somehow end up being able to, to get all the frames that produced it, right? 
from a standard kind of just addition, I can't do that, right? Once the data is, 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 uh, is low pass, I'm, I'm, I'm lost, right? So the way that you get across, uh, with, uh, um, get around it, is this notion of a piecewise coded exposure. And what we're going to do here then is, remember like when I was talking about reproducing the signal, I said you had to have this random matrix that then that essentially gives you the samples for, you know, for the signal. Uh, what I'm going to do now is this random matrix is not going to be a single um, uh, spatial matrix. Now, I have demonstrated in our papers that we published on where we can essentially just take random samples of an image and we can reproduce the image, all, uh, the original image, all the way back to various degrees of accuracy depending on the amount of uh, data that we keep. Right? But this time, it's not just a spatial because we talk about video. We are also going to do it temporally random. So not only are you just basically having this, this data pattern on your, on, on your x, in your x and y, but you're going to have a data pattern in your t, right? So your, your video that you end up recording is essentially a volume, right? With, where, where each one of these lines that is drawn over here represents what a pixel integrates, right? So pixel location let's say 25, 25, which is maybe this one here, starts integrating somewhere, that, let's say, you know, uh, two milliseconds into the domain, into the, integrate into the, the, the this uh, total, ah, excuse me, into this uh, total um, time here, um, and then it stops at some point later, right? And by, so now you're covering both space and time, right? And I end up with one coded image again, right? Which is now contained both the spatial and the temporal image. As opposed to over here, I have one that contained only the spatial information, essentially, all the time. The time information was lost in its collapse. So then I can then go back to my reconstruction. Now, my matrices obviously now becomes a bit more complicated because it's, it's basically three dimensional as opposed to two dimensional, right? But I can go back and I can reconstruct my original image, and this original image is going to be essentially ideally back to this notion. So how does that work? Well, this is the flow that leads back to what I was talking about. The sensing matrix now becomes this two-dimensional, uh, three-dimensional matrix. Uh, my dictionary is going to be what sits over here. That's going to be essentially that's going to tell me what is the best dictionary for to, to reproduce. And then of course I'm going to apply the of the lapse of minimization to determine what my alphas should be such that I can reproduce my signal exactly, right? So in 2011, um, you know, Hakami basically presented this idea, but what was not, what, what, what he did was look a little bit more at these metrics being um, uh, more like a wavelet transform and district cosine transform. One thing that we, another step that we took is to, is to improve this idea by learning the dictionary. Turns out that the dictionary can be a function of the data itself. It can be a signal dependent dictionary. And a signal dependent dictionary ends up being a lot better at reproducing the, the waveform than, what, than just kind of a, a generic um, you know, DCT or, or, or DRDT uh, dictionary. So we still have to obviously present, you know, kind of construct this circuit, right? Make the chip do it, right? And this is this, the the kind of what um, your pixel would, would, would have looked like typically, right? Typically your pixel has a photo detector, it has a reset switch that resets its value, then it has an output buffer. And as you reset this node, then you let the photo detector discharge um, this value here, and that gets buffered out of the pixel, and when you read it out of the pixel, that's how you get your beautiful picture of the cell phone. That's basically what your cell phone works, right? What we're doing here is we're adding an additional switch that controls when that bar in time, when it actually comes on. Okay, so we're doing an exposure control. And then on top of that, we have to put memory inside the pixel that will allow a <laughs> one-bit memory that will allow us to grab a, that randomized bit pattern. And then that randomized bit pattern comes in through, uh, so, 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 so in other words, it, there's two forms of randomization. There's a spatial randomization and temporal randomization, right? So you have to have essentially two random number generators, right? That is controlling when that, that, um, that EXT switch turns off. 
and that can be all done with linear feedback differentiators that would have one. In fact, for this case, a linear feedback differentiator is the ideal uh, scenario because with video, what do you want to do? You want to reproduce it every so often, right? Typically, when we don't like linear feedback differentiator because the randomness comes back again, right? It repeats itself, right? And we say that's not a, that's not a true random number generator. That's why it's pseudo random, right? But in video, that is exactly what you want because you want to grab a certain frame, collapse it, and then you want to grab another certain frame, collapse it, and so on. But then these collapse frames you want to reproduce, to, you want to reconstruct to fill in all the stuff in between. Okay. So the circuit exists. I won't go into the details of all the pieces of it, but the important thing are are uh, here, where you have the array now. Obviously, you have some kind of drivers for the for the memory, you have your random number generators, you still need your ADCs. And the cool thing about these ADCs, they only come on only if that pixel is trying to, you know, trying to digitize that number, right? So the places where there's no, no need to record, it never comes on. It's a part of assumption, basically. Uh, remember that ADC was a big chunk of our data? That can be now you know, reduced significantly. These are two versions of the chip. This was the first one, which was a uh, one inch by one point seven, and with a pixel pitch of ten microns, and the more recent one is to fifty six uh, to fifty six at six, uh, six microns, that's six nine point one pitch. But you, but what you're getting at? Uh, oh, another thing that we do here as well is once we digitize the values, we also have an ultra wide band communication. So this chip here, all it needed was power and an antenna, okay, and a clock. Yes, power clock and antenna. That was it. And it would, Essentially, just generate out the videos, and then on the other hand, we collect it, and we reconstruct it. So, how does the reconstruction work? So, there's a couple of ways you can go about, you know, about. Again, you can use kind of the, you know, the the standard DCT or DWT approaches, and what you end up getting is, look, you're going to get, you know, because this, this truck is moving, that's why you get this blurring effect, right? And DCT is a little bit better than a uh, than the DWT. So it's 3D because it's Two x at the end of time, right? On the other hand, here, if you essentially don't use these kernels as your bases, but you learn the kernel through the data as it passes by, you see that your kernels now are a little bit more varied, and they they match the data a little bit better. Okay. So then, from there, when you when I thought you know this was an earlier piece of work. Uh, value at, at all, and you can see that the data is, is a lot better at reconstructing this rock. Well, in our case, what we are doing um, is that we're going to learn the particular set of, um, uh, of uh, re representation for this I blink. And what you will see is that these here are the coded images that were, that, that were recorded. So from these five frames of coded images, we are able to reconstruct 70 frames <coughs> of uncoded, right? Of, 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 um, of yeah, of uh, reconstructed. This is what you would have seen if you adjusted that collapse, that sum, right? Most of the time, the eyes are open, so hence you see mainly the eye and the um, uh, the pupil. Occasionally, it closes. That's why there's a little bit of a blur on top, right? Uh, but when you go and you ask where, you know, at different points of the of that 70 frames, you can see the pictures that I showed. And this is a video of it running, and you can you will see that you know this is now this whole entire sequence is generated from one from from the set of five frames, or, or so equivalent. Okay, and it's running in fact a little bit faster than real time because when we reconstruct it, then we're playing it. it so motion blurring is gone, and uh, we are able to uh, reconstruct missing data that did not exist previously. Uh -huh. So uh, there must be some memory uh, regarding the time uh, on, on the time axis. So, so your entire something matrix is known, and that's part of your reconstruction sequence, right? So, so, so what by means of memory. I think what you're asking is that there's basically two types of memory, right? There's memory within the pixels themselves, right? That essentially controls when things are on. But in the reconstruction is where the real memory comes into play, right? If I know that volume, I can reconstruct. Yeah, so you have now volume of the reconstruction matrix. Is 
Is yes. It? Yes, it's a 3D fecal structure matrix, not a 2D anymore. Because the, even the um, even the randomized the matrix is 3D as well, right? It's basically that, that random uh, this way and that way. So, but also then now you are taking away um, the spatial and temporal correlations that were ex being exploited in the compression uh, in the in the video compression algorithms, right? Because there are no correlations. You are exploiting those correlations in the case. And, uh, right. So because therefore, compression is going to be now significantly uh, less. Um, if I were to compress your coded you know, frames, there will be hardly any correlation for right. uncoded. Yes. So I have not. So compar comparatively, what would be if I would do pure compression uh, versus I, if I would use your compressive sensing, right. what is the, and assuming that you have the, the, the reconstruction matrix overhead also. Right, so, 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 so there are a couple of thoughts there, right? So the, the, so the whole idea then is that <coughs> when you look at the, um, the coded image, the multiple coded image, you wouldn't have like the, the motion vectors that are exploded in MPA again and so on, right? At least not explicitly. I would argue that you probably could do something more on it to, to extract some correlation, because they're still part of the same general sequence, right? It's just that now you've got this coded representation as opposed to a pure representation, right? So you do not have the, um, you know, the, the, the block matching thing that, that MPEG would do, right? We have done that, that comparison between like an MPEG approach versus like a compressive approach, right? And for, I mean, MPEG would get you better quality image for sure, right? Because you can still see a little bit of blurring <coughs> and so on in, in this image, right? However, the total number of bits that it is required to represent the data is much smaller in our case. But you do pay a penalty in, in terms of the quality of the image. Um, I still think that, you know, this is like an unexplored component, which is to look at what are the correlations between the coded images and see whether that can be exported as well. Yeah, going back to the issues of timing, uh, so in principle you will have to have a timer for each one of the pixels, right? Or are you going to still do the something due to the frame rate? So, there's n so in this case there's no explicit frame rate other than that volume frame rate, right? The TV is what, you're, is what you are looking at, right? So that's, I, so I picked that to be, let's say, 200 milliseconds, right? Which corresponds to 5 frames per second. Um, so, so, so let's say that's, that's the time, right? The P, um, the ex control exposure time, right? That's generated locally by that random pseudo, pseudo random sequence generator. But you put a random It's it's kind of it's the um, it's the control parameter that that I provide the system, right? And everybody is sampled the same way, right? Now I think there is another ex interesting problem that we are also exploiting, exploiting now is what if I did not only make the temporal position randomized, but the temporal time length of that integration I also that randomized? I thought that would be, that's why I was saying. Yeah, so, so if you do that, you can come, now you get the third, another element that you said was so important, which is the high dynamic range. And I'll show an example of movement towards that, and that's the kind of thing that we're exploring now. So is there a reason to treat the time, time differently in this whole thing? Or is there a time you just like one more access, just like you're sampling in randomly sampling in XY? You can just Yeah, so exactly. It's one more it except it's time. Yes. Exactly. So it's so so it's just a third dimension. Yes. So there's no there's no other spe special property other than the fact that you know you have yeah. to actually integrate photons. Right? So that, that that has to happen as a real thing. That's that's one thing that hasn't happened, right? Alright, so I see time is Running out. So, so here is the thing that uh, uh, another aspect that I want to um, emphasize that you can get faster images, but you have really poor signal to noise, it's dark. Or you can get better signal to noise, it's brighter, but you have slower images, right? More blurry, right? In our case, the, the important thing is that with these coded frames, you can get essentially both, right? That's the thing. You can get both high, high dynamic range and you can get. Uh, better, uh, um, you know, less better. 
Oh, coming back to the question of what had any range. So Srina um Shrina here in in O one sent out this paper where he basically showed that look, instead, you know, I can basically treat Hadamic range as a similar problem as color, right? For those of you who are not familiar with color, co the way that colors are done in, 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 in cameras is that you have this thing called a bear pattern where you basically go green, there's a green filter followed by a blue filter, followed by a green filter, followed by a blue filter, and so on and so forth in one line. And then the next line, you have red followed by green, and then red and, and so on and so forth, right? So each pixel actually sees one color. But somehow, we get you know, beautiful pictures. So how is that done? Well, that's because in the processing of the image as it comes off, there's a mixing, there's a color mixing that happens, right? So why couldn't uh, I essentially use the same notion where I would have multiple um, exposures being distributed throughout the array, right? Where I would have some short exposures and then some long exposure, then I have to, again, do some kind of uh, optimal mixing for me to get a wider range of it, right? And he did this, and he showed that, hey, you, know, you can exactly, you, know, you can get, you know, like here, but you couldn't see anything, now you can, and so on, right? So that was a pretty cool result, but this was all done entirely on a single image and done in, um, you know, on a, uh, in, in software. So we can actually do that as part of the same hardware that we're talking about, we can sample it in such a way where we have different um, um, exposure time for different pixels, right? And then we can use the same reconstruction synthesis uh, that we've done previously, and we can go from a you know, combination essentially of the dark, the bright, the mask, and we end up you know, something that is much, you know, much, much more, uh, uh, and see all the details of that. So, what that should show you is that we have the capability now of combining possibly the spatial and the temporal and the video to kind of solve all the problems of video in one, right? So you know, at least that's what I'd like to do. Um, so in summary for this part, and then I, you know, I'm just going to get only part way through my next part, and I'm just going to do um, you know, maybe a couple of jumps. Um, what you end up is a camera that is tiny. So this is a penny. This is the size of our camera. Uh, the reason we want it so small is because we want to mount it on flying um, devices. Uh, it's basically, uh, we're also thinking about putting it on insects, you know, to basically try to uh, walk around and see what goes on. What is really happening underneath your cupboard with that roach runs around? I don't know. Right. Uh, let us not spend too much time. Oh, this is another area of this application of this thing. is basically making tiny microscopes. Right, where again you have really small power budgets that you need to get the data off. Right, and that now can be placed <coughs> on top of, of, of mice as they regularly run around in, in uh, behavioral neuroscientific experiments. And you can see what the neurons are doing. And that's what we need to uh, pursue right now by uh, my collaboration with my students. Uh, okay, so now let's jump over over to the other side and think about the same problem now being and being applied to neural recordings. So the main thing, yeah, I already kind of um, motivated why we want to kill this whole entire part of our stream. And the same idea as previously applies. The big difference is what sits over here. Okay, is the, is the dictionary, the signal dependent dictionary. That's really the only, you know, kind of, you know, uh, intellectual leap that one Right? And to do that, you basically have to record a string of neural spikes. Turns out that not every neuron spikes exactly the same way. So I can then apply some kind of clustering algorithm to, to break up the different uh, uh, clusters. Um, and from there, I can see the different shapes. Right? So this one spikes up more up or down, this one down, and this one has a longer uh, rebound, and so on and so forth. Right? So those are each individual shapes of particular neural response. Right? So given that then, I should be able to create a dictionary now that is composed of your expected um, waveform that you get. Okay? So another aspect of, of, um, of this type of work is that people have been trying for a long time to do what's called spike sorting, which is this notion that you have a bunch of arrays, you, even, even, even a single electron. Let's take the simple case, a single electrode, right? It is the location. It reads neurons, right? 
each neuron is slightly different, right? And you need to partition. You say, oh, yeah, that spike was from neuron one. Oh, no, that one was neuron two. Oh, that one was neuron three. That's what spikes order. This is so that I can move it around. Typically, with spikes orders, all you have is a label of where it came from. Neuron one, neuron two, neuron four, neuron one, neuron three, neuron four, and so on, so on right? What we care about is not only do we want to have the shape of the spike, but we wanted to know what goes on after the spike itself has disappeared. What is the residue? What is the remainder of the signal as it's bouncing off this thing called local fluid potential, which your brain is always changing, which is a, actually an aggregate of other neurons beneath the fiber and so on, right? And that did not exist, right? So what we were trying to do then is, essentially what we do is we generate the compressed sample. From the compressed samples, we can reconstruct the most likely spike that produced it. We know what the compressed samples for that spike alone should be. So then we can subtract them out and get just the residue of what's remaining, right? And then you know that was still in the compressed space, right? Because that residue is in the compressed space. And then you can reconstruct the actual waveform that would have produced it. So you do kind of a, uh, you know, first detect, subtract out residue, Determine what the residue means, and then add the residue back to what you have originally detected. And you end up with this much more realistic representation of this way. So that's the kind of the, the approach that we're going to take. And we can show, you know, like if this is a sequence that, you know, again, showing the same kind of thing, where I had the, uh, the original signal, I recover only the spike part, then I, I, then I get, you know, this is just the, the, the residue waveform of what's left over. Um, then I get the residue, and I reconstruct what the residue part looks like, and I come back to them together, and I get kind of the better waveform. And, and this shows, you know, a better matching between the original, which was blue, and now the reconstructed. You know, yes, you can get some evidence of that. It's measured in terms of what is the uh, SNDR, the uh, sig signal distortion. And we can show that uh, with this approach, we can be pretty much a number of different techniques out there in terms of trying to figure out how, you know, how few transistor counts, how small frequency, and how low number of, 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 um, of uh, samples that you need to take. Right? The lower this figure of merit, the better. Right? That means, again, to transmit, I need fewer and fewer bits. Right? That's really good to get. What are the fewer bits? So as I indicated, we actually built this. Uh, so this is what the framework looks like. There's the front, uh, front end. There's some kind of programmable gain amplifier. Then we get to the to a MUX that will allow us to do multiple channels. Then there's a single ADC that then goes into the CS box, which is a mixing part. And then once it goes out, we basically go through either machinery learning during the first pass or, the, or similar reconstruction during the subsequent pass. Right? And then, this was very important, <coughs> which is to say the following, right? Um, so I learned and I figured out there were five neurons that were spiking next to this particular um, electrode. And I'm reconstructing, everybody's happy. And then all of a sudden, I get one neuron that I've never seen before, just creep up and fire. But it's not in my dictionary, right? So how, firstly, how do I know that my signal that I'm now getting is from a neuron that I had not seen before. And then secondly, how do I, you know, re, kind of recalibrate my system to take into consideration the one that I've never seen before. So somehow I had to, oh, and only thing I have is the compressed signal the first time I see it, right? Maybe later on I might have it because I've re-recorded it. But the first time I see it, all I have is the compressed signal. So I've got to be sure that in my compressed signal, I have that ability to detect. So the thing that we did when that is basically to, oh, well, before I get there, let me just show you some actual measurements from monkey data. It's, we're not allowed to show animals in videos. So anyway, the monkey is behind this piece of And these are all our setups. And these are in the case where you get a really clean signal to noise, nice, beautiful neurons. Right? And these little guys over here may also be neurons, which is part of the right? Um, you can see, remember, in a low signal to noise scenario, you got all this data, right? But somehow you got to be able to reproduce, right? And we can see the reconstruction that, that we have that matches it. You know, pretty nice. So let's just go back now to this notion of, of detecting errors. 
So I trained my dictionary based on that. So these these red spots that are in this uh, in this uh, particular uh, PCA um, uh, principal components um, in the clustering algorithm, right? And I know what my waveform looks like, right? So if everything is going well, when I get a new neuron, it's going to be basically embedded within what I've trained, right? But what if I get now, I've trained on, the, on um, these guys, the red ones, and then I get all these black ones, right? So when I reconstruct, my error is going to be really huge between my reconstructed signal and what it's supposed to be, right? But I don't know it's supposed to be because I don't have the original signal, right? So somehow we've got to figure out when the condition of bad reconstruction has happened, right? So it turns out that if I look at the SNDR, the signal um, to noise um, uh, distortion rate uh, for the on the actual waveform, which is what this VRX is, right, versus on these sample data, right, that they are actually correlated and they're correlated pretty nicely, right. So then all I need to really do is see whether or not I have really bad SNDR, why, as opposed to having to wait till I get the X to really do it on the X, which would be the real way to do it, right? So I can approximate, I can, I can, I can measure without having a good signal. And that's the, kind of the, you know, the uh, intellectual leap. And given that then, I can go ahead and I can detect effectively when a bad signal happens. So notice, this is now SNDR X again, it's all good, you know, we have a pretty high SNDR, shall we say, and then something bad happened here, right? There's a new signal that came in, that if I don't do anything, right, I don't, re I don't learn, I don't take it because of this new signal, then my, um, my, my with, uh, without retraining would be the gray, which would always be worse in SNDR than if I were to relearn that new signal, right? Which is a bad. You see the exact same waveform, so the Y by itself, just with the compressed space, I can do this. I can reconstruct nicely. So that's exactly what we do. And this is what a waveform showing you. You know, if I learned only neuron one, and then uh, neuron two came, my SNDR Y is going to collapse. But then if I relearn, I get back to a nice SNDR. Then if both X and Y comes in and I've learned, it's all wonderful, right? Um, if on the other hand, I haven't learned, because one, because one I've learned previously, then it improves, but it doesn't improve sufficiently. Then if neuron three comes, it really collapses the one I haven't learned. But then when I relearn, again, I get back. And now when one point three comes, my value of SNDR Y is pretty high, whereas when the other one is not. Right? So that's basically showing the, the, the actual thing action. So uh, getting close to the end. So this is um, the um, kind of the, uh, the summary of what I've presented. Uh, on this part, right? So compressed and signal hours basically measure both uh, spikes and interspikes interval, basically, the, the low, uh, local field potential. We get you know, accuracy in terms of identifying spikes, even if we work only on the, um, uh, on the, in the compressed space, we really high, like ni upper 90s in terms of classification accuracy. We can do online detection of anomalies, so new neurons coming in. And we can relearn to basically close the loop and always keep updating as well. So, so that was a pretty important result for us. Uh, in terms of building, uh, now comparing to what people have done, not many of have worked in this space in terms of actually build these systems in hardware, and we have, and we can, you know, essentially down to, you know, microwatts of power. So, all right. What does it look like in the future? It looks something like this. We are now working on something that we call the, um, the microbead which is a, 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 a 100 micron by 100 micron here. You know, I dream it as being a, a sphere, but it's probably going to be a square, I mean a cube, right? Where you have essentially the ability to report and to stimulate within the same 100 micron by 100 microns. Um, and we have actually done it. Uh, it's like just for the simulation part. Not the reporting part is still working on it. <coughs> actually implemented the report. So this is the system, it's there. It's still a little bit bigger than I'd like it to be. I keep getting my students, I need it smaller, I need it smaller. So I think the one that we currently have is about 200 microns uh, on the side. Uh, you see the coil that basically receives the energy, then the circuit that does the, the rectification and all that. Um, 
that. Uh, we are implementing it in an SOI, a uh, fully integrated SOI format, uh, 30 nanometers, where we can uh, basically uh, uh, etch away the substrate. So it's, it's the entire thing encoded in silicon dioxide, right? So we still need to play some tricks with the electrodes on the side to make it you know, uh, more compatible with tissue. Right now it's aluminum, which is not optimal. So we are looking at the the gold as well as with uh, platinum. We have embedded into the side in the rack. This is it over here. And these are now signals that we've been this week that we pass to the side in the get the rack to actually kick, you know, and get some um, data being transmitted to this to 150 micron by 150 micron. Okay. So overall I hope ooh, wow, that's the first time. Overall I hope that I've, I've convinced you that compressive sampling is an interesting idea from a single processing perspective that has a, you know, many different applications, including video as well as oral recordings. The basic idea is that the dictionary should be signal dependent. And that's what you know, kind of what we are, you know, in the context of doing. And we've been able to reconstruct uh, signal dependent um, uh, dictionaries that, that allows us to get really a resolution reconstruction of the, uh, the signal itself. Um, you know, many students and um, and folks have worked on this project with us along the way. Folks have fabricated things. My former postdocs have gone on and moved on to different things. People have funded the work. And ultimately, this is the most important part, which is the students are actually get to do. By the way, this is Jack. Um, and uh, yeah, it's been really fun to work on this. And thank you so much for your attention.